Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcasts. G'day and welcome to another extra, extra read all about it special edition of Thrash and Treasure, the torture chamber musical comedy podcast that will kick a nerd in the shins and steal their lunch money. Speaking of lunch, I'm hungry, but you can call me Aaron, and I'm joined unusually by my co host from a different show host. She's one third of our master debating team, and I know her as her, her, she, shit, but you know her as Mimi Kaka. It's my co host, Lara. Yay! How was your week in music? Have you listened to anything interesting? You know, I did actually listen to something interesting, but I think we're going to get into that in a moment. Yeah, I think we are. Have you been watching the Olympics? Oh, on and off. I haven't really been Uh seeing through all of it. Yeah? Yeah, mainly been uh, catching up on the little snippets that they give you online afterwards. Got some goals. Well, I I love the Olympics, the me opening ceremonies and all that. And I'd been so excited about Japan. And I, yeah, obviously, I've said it before many times, nearly every episode, I miss Japan and I want to go back there. Yeah. In, um, oh, I can't remember where it was, the the name of the pro, uh, the, um, prefecture, but, uh, we were at the Lego Discovery Center. Mm, Yeah. There's a whole big, um, entertainment complex and it's like, Madame Two Swords and I think a cinema and heaps of time zone in Australia, uh, arcades. But in Japan, actually, playing arcade games is actually considered gambling. Oh, they have a vending machine for everything over there anyway. Like, you can literally, like, buy little costumes for your little kitty cats or your little puppy dogs. Yeah, but this is um, in terms of, of playing for a prize, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we went to walk in there just to play a couple of games thinking, oh, yeah, it's an arcade. We do that in Australia. Nope. It's illegal to take a child into an arcade in Japan. But the um, in, in that center, there was a the toilets and the urinals had little screens. I think I probably told you this before because I was so excited by it. Um, and when you are... Um, but for the listeners, we'll give it to the listeners. Yeah, we'll give it to the listeners that... When you are relieving yourself, if you will, there's a little cartoon bear that appears on the screen also piddling into a toilet and it will measure how many milliliters or liters, if you're that way inclined. I doubt anyone can go liters, but go on. <laughs> well, you know, anyways, anyways, um, yeah, it measures how much you piddle out. And if you fill up three cups, you get a prize. So can you just get like three friends together and put all over the same bowl and get the prize anyway? Oh, I never thought of that. Rig the system. Yeah, mm. I should have gone up to some random dude and asked him. <laughs> like, hey, do you want to pee in, in this with me? <laughs> yeah, I speak pretty good Japanese, so... I'll learn how to say, would you like to share a bowl with me? Oh, I was about to ask you how you would say that in Japanese, but if you've got to learn, then then we'll wait for it. I will learn it. Anyways, based on that, right, based on the fact that even just piddling in Tokyo was fun, (laughs) I was so excited about the opening ceremony of sort of what technology is going to be showcased here and the cultural stuff was fantastic. We got tap dancing. That made me so goddamn excited. Yeah, yeah. But it just plateaued, I think. I, I was so disappointed. I know they lost their director. Well, they didn't lose their director. They fired their director right beforehand, plus COVID. So... Yeah, I think I think definitely the... Um, the even though, like, people viewing it from at home would have gotten the applause or the extra emotive noises that would normally yep. happen in real life. I feel like yep. that probably really took away from their own ability to know when they were doing a good job and to feel that exuberance to really set up a performance. You know, there are a lot of cool things, but um, yeah, I think it's definitely in a different atmosphere this year, which unfortunately, mm-hmm. especially somewhere like Japan, you know, yeah. have been... Um, you know, they've done a lot of great things anyway, um, like even awarding their medals from 
recycled materials and all that sort of stuff, all that innovation that, you know, Japan is famous for yeah. um, and all their quirkiness as well. It's not just innovation, but their quirkiness too. Um, yeah, it was just lost. Yeah, I think may have been a bit lost this, this time yeah. around and, you know, even being postponed for a year, it's understandable that they wouldn't have wanted to postpone it in a year and there's oh, a lot of political stuff we could get into that we won't. But, yeah, it is it is a shame. It is a, it's definitely a shame, but it's great nice. that they were able to go ahead with it, that they yeah. have anyway. Don't get me wrong, I still loved every minute of it. I cried yeah. several times during it like an absolute loser so much excitement it was um i was so yeah. thrilled for it to be happening at this time mm. the individual portions were great on their own but i don't think it the it was a it, the sum wasn't greater than its parts is that the term oh, you tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had built myself up for this for yeah. years since yeah. even before I went to Japan. Yeah, Tokyo would have been so great. Hey? Yeah, um, if we, if we if people had been able to go, they would have done such a fucking good. Oh, excuse my French. Such oh, a great let job. It, let it swear. Such a fucking great job. Seriously, they really would have. Yeah, um, had it been any other year. But yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But anyways, guess what? What? We have another legendary diva in our fun home today, and I'm so excited my hair might fall out. He's the original rock star of Broadway, whose amazing journey through all facets of media have me dropping to the floor Wayne's World style since we're not worthy, because this man has been, or not to been, a Shakespearean thespian, a guitarist and recording artist, a TV star, and James Gandolfini's special delivery in The Mexican. Plus, he had a bug-sized but explosive role in Ant-Man and the Wasp, sunk his teeth into a Cirque du Freak, and will live forever in fame, the TV series, as Ian Ware. Oh, shit, that's my cousin. Anyways, this legendary artist has been a butcher, a barber, a booth, and a bechtel, as well as a six-time Tony nominee, including two wins, one Best Actor for playing House in Fun Home, and another Tony for having the biggest pistol. And if that wasn't enough, he ruled the Argentine alongside Evita. Oh, hey, Ricky Martin, call me. Hit the ice on the Titanic and was absurdly absurd by nerds as Observer September, if you remember the cult show Fringe. Anyways, we've had our fair share of illustrious guests, but this time he's a sensation. So today we're letting this cattle loose in a record shop. So please give the most Aussiest, the most fair dinkumist g'day to the man who truly saved the world in Avengers Endgame. And I will fight you on that. Holy meat pies, Batman. It's Michael freaking Cerberus. Welcome to the torture chamber. How's it going? Well, better and better now after that introduction. Thank you. I, uh, did, I, did I say your name right? <laughs> <laughs> you did, which is remarkable. I have been watching all these videos and I don't know what is wrong with people, but they keep getting a name wrong. It's not that freaking I know. hard, people. I know. And and sometimes it'll be like seconds before the broadcast or before the interview and they'll be saying, so say it again for me, say it again. And I'll say Cerberus. And they write Cerberus, Cerberus, Cerberus. I'm here with Michael Cerberus. And I'm like, yep. well... <laughs> yep. oh, yeah. services I, I heard you got called yeah. the other day yeah, i've i've been called some very strange things have you well you're on this show now just don't call me late for dinner as long as you're calling me full stop like yes i'm <laughs> right. utterly uh satisfied and now firstly um those listeners at home who who have followed your career your absolutely remarkable career holy shit uh, over the years would know you've gained a bit of a reputation for playing some sort of deeper darker characters with some inner turmoil so it begs the question do you need a hug? <laughs> all the time, especially after the last 15 months. Yes. Uh, I, I, look, don't we all? I tell you what. I have. Yeah. Now, I, I'm going to put this out there now. I have a confession to make. Before we get into anything, I, I don't want any spoilers. I was a huge fan of Fringe. Now, I never saw season five because I never wanted it to end. It is still going on TV in my head. So <laughs> no spoilers, please, for what's going on at the moment in Fringe. I, I, I was devastated when Lost ended. You can ask Lara. I am still today. <laughs> never heard the end of it. <laughs> Anyways, it's, it's not about Lost. It's about Fringe. Now, I have to ask, was it a relief to play such a, a monotonal poker-faced character that has so much behind them? It really was. I've always yeah. loved, if I'm in a play and my character enters the stage and is sort of on the stage for any amount of time, especially if it's a few minutes before I have to speak. 
those are my favorite ways to enter a show because I love to just sort of be there without having the the requirement of speaking. Um, mm -hmm. And so this this job was like that every day, and it was really yeah. I love the the challenge of being expressive without having words to do it, and uh, and it was. And I mean, it was fun eventually when I did get to speak, but, um, but I really, I really enjoyed the kind of trying to find as many shades and colors with as few, you know, syllables as possible. A much easier day to learn your, your lines. There. Well, there's certainly that. Yeah. Uh, and was it fun getting sent around by Fox to all these different <laughs> gigs, like the American Idol? I, didn't, I remember you popping up in the American Idol yeah. audience. I was terribly excited. It was, so was I. It was the most fantastic and bizarre marketing campaign because the only way it could make any sense to you as a viewer was if you were already a viewer of the show and already watching yeah. it. So it wasn't likely to add new viewers. It was really more of a, a gift from JJ Abrams and the creators to the people who are already watching it. Um, and mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully, hoping that maybe, you know, they would be in a room with other people watching it and, and going, oh my God, that's this observer. And other people would say, observer, yeah. what's he? And, you know, I guess that was the marketing idea. But uh, but for me, it meant I got to go to all of these fantastic places. I was in the pits at the Texas Motor Speedway for a NASCAR race. I was at mm -hmm. the, uh, the All-Star Baseball game. I was on the sidelines at the G um, Giants uh, Eagles NFC Championship game in the Meadowlands and, and like all these great, great things. And Josh Jackson used to... <laughs> get so pissed off when I would be next on set and he would be like I'm here busting my ass every day at work and you're flying off and like having all these great yeah. adventures while you know while I'm doing all this heavy lifting well uh and also to add insult to injury I actually cut out a joke about Josh Jackson the play on Ricky Martin call me uh -huh. I was gonna go no Josh Jackson call me but I cut it out at the last minute so sorry Josh Jackson you lose out again to Michael Sobers. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do, mate? I'm, I'm sad. Now, uh, we'll, we'll move on because, um, oh, actually, no, but I, I do want to know, did you name your Sweeney Razors? Oh, I guess that was a missed opportunity. That was a missed opportunity, but it's also a sociopathic thing to do. So you're probably <laughs> on the right side there. Maybe it's for the best, yeah. Yes, poss quite possibly for the best. But uh, anyways, this week, uh, you chose the metal album. Yes. Now, would you like to tell our listeners what you have chosen and what? Why? Uh, I have chosen Queensryche's uh, Operation Mind Crime, and I chose it because I I first learned of Queensryche um, back ages ago when I was doing Fame with Carrie Hamilton, um, and uh, and she one day said, "You have to. Do you know this band?" And I didn't at the time. And she said, "Oh, you have to. You have to hear them. They're they're amazing." Um, and and especially the lead singer's voice, which you know is pretty incredible. Um, so I became I became a fan in general. And then this this record, you know, when you described what what the uh, the concept of the show is, I thought this was kind of perfect because it's uh, it's I was listening to it again yesterday just to you know re reacquaint myself with it, and um, and it really I think is a terrific rock opera i mean it really it has a very clear narrative clearer than the original tommy uh narrative the original who album uh narrative yep. and um and it's you know it's got all the elements of of a musical and and then it's got this great 80s metal thing going on and uh uh you know any 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 rock opera that rhymes raison d'etre with forget her i think you know i think you're in good hands. That's how much I don't pay attention to lyrics as a, a running theme of this show. I completely miss that rhyme and I would have gone crazy if I heard that. But yes, yeah, so, okay, now it's funny you um, you mentioned the, the story being clear because I did write a review. Oh, excellent. As I do every week. I, I Again, I warned you about that. And so we'll see if the narrative was clear to me. <laughs> Uh, so would we like to hear this review? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I'll, I'll, Lara, I don't care. You're going to listen to it anyway. Yeah, I've got no choice. I already You've know that. Got no choice. Wouldn't matter if we're recording or not, I would read it. Anyways, when I first saw the coveted album Operation Mind Crime, I was rather pleased. I've always wanted a Minority Report musical, and I love me some Tom Cruise. 
So I clicked go on the Spotify to hear what type of American made rock of ages did Michael server us up immediately <laughs> with my eyes wide shut, yet my ears and mind ready for days of thunder. The taps of the nurse's shoes on the cold linoleum floor, followed by the impatient patient sedation, left me wondering what sordid cocktail is in the syringe. But judging by the second track's militaristic vibe, it was something far and away better than what's in my coffee. Mm. Anyway, I ultimately became swept up in this war of the worlds of music, with the firm rock opera influence narrated by ye old medieval madrigal mixed with a sublimely 80s guitar riff. It's this night and day concoction that leaves no collateral. Once those almost mocking vocals kick in, with the stadium anthem Revolution Calling, that this strange musical adaptation starts to blossom like a magnolia. But as the narrative became clearer, as clear as a vanilla sky after the rain man edges to wash away the familiar plot, and while I started to have doubts, I noticed the next more titular track would easily be sung by a few good men in bloody doctor's scrubs while focused on their medical mission. Impossible, yet compelling guitars lead us to speak, which judging by the gloom and doom of this song seems like risky business. But once Sweet Sister Mary began, I wondered how much all this devil music was starting to affect my hearing. Has Michael Cerverus snuck his way onto this album? Though I must admit, I kind of miss his Born on the Fourth of July country twang. <laughs> but as the apparently popular album progressed with a runtime of 108 hours, and despite some familiar Tommy-esque chords in parts, it's clear that the Queen's rich because this album sounds like the colour of money. But where I would call the Who the grandfathers of punk and Tommy the father of rock opera, does that make Queensryche the mummy? I ask because to cavemen like me, the outsiders of heavily metal music, it seems that this band has mostly made all the right moves. Shit, did I do that one already? But those at the top are going to be looked at more closely and I couldn't quite shake the familiarity behind Shades of Tommy. And upon my second, third and even my tenth listen, I've been trying to hear where Colin Farrell fits in. In fact, I'm starting to think this album has nothing to do with Minority Report at all. Who wrote it? Anthony Burgess? Where was I? Oh yeah. A Clockwork Orange, you're glad I'm giving it four stars. Oh, that's actually a pretty good score, hey? It was. I quite enjoyed it. That, that, was that a madrigal? <laughs> there, it's, got, it's, got, it's got these like, you know, Bach kind of, uh, you know, orchestral guitar sort of moments and, and absolutely has... Pantaloons. Yeah has some magical aspects to it too. It does. And that song, that seriously sounded like you on the album. It really did. Well, thanks. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. I, I always sort of, my problem with, with a lot of rock and metal stuff when I was growing up was that the singers were all, had such high voices and I could never, I could just never sing that high that long, especially Jeff Tate, who's a singer of Queensryche. He's kind of extraordinarily, you know, gifted in in that upper register. In fact, I think he I think he sings the women's parts also. Like I think he on I think he's the only singer on the record, and the the female characters sing, and I think he just sings those too. Um, oh wow! I probably should have done my research more. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think I think it sounded like that, but uh, I didn't go back and yeah. check. But anyway, I, I appreciate you thinking that I, I could have been on some of those tracks. So it's had your cadence in the in the voice. It really, I, I, I flipped me out. And look, I've listened to so much heavy metal that I really do think it's starting to affect my sensibilities. So I could just be going crazy. <laughs> oh, certainly your hearing. And, or am I hearing too? Because I, I have been turning up the musicals very, very loud. But yeah, no, look, I quite enjoyed it. And I would like to see how it played. Like I, But I didn't get the story. That's the thing. I, I it seemed to clockwork RNG. Yeah, it's always tricky on a record. I think they put more time than most people do into trying to make the narrative, you know, such as it was, clear. And and the lyrics actually do sort of tell the story in a way, in the same way that lyrics and musicals do. Which is, that's I think an interesting thing because so many people, there are so many you know jukebox musicals which are always a challenge to 
to match a story to songs that weren't written to convey story or to convey that story. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I really feel like they they spent the time and whether they had any background in theater, I don't know. I kind of suspect some of them might because... Oh, they're in metal. It's theatrical. <laughs> yeah, they certainly understand theater. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but they put more energy into trying to to make it coherent from a narrative standpoint. And I do remember, I saw them play this album. I saw a tour when they were touring this and they, they, you know, they had a lot of film components and stuff. And they, you know, they, I don't think there was ever an attempt to, I think it was, you know, the way the Who would play the Tommy album as, as a, a concert. Um, I, it was, it was like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a stage production, um, yeah. but uh but they they definitely had a lot of video and film elements to try to tell the story and make it a, a musical you know rock concert. Yep, I said it, it threw me off because the title sounds Minority Reportish. Totally, yeah. But the plot seemed what I could gather from it seemed Clockwork Orangey, but in the later yeah. half where he gets taken and locked up or whatever it is. Yeah, it's I mean it's it's much. not the most original. It, it borrows from any number of of dystopian stories and and you know revolution against the corrupt forces. Yeah. But uh, the man, the man, exactly. The quote unquote, the man, the patriarchy, as we say these days. I guess. What did you think, Lara? Because I know. Yeah, you... no, I was I was certainly very impressed. Um, yeah. Quite often, when it comes to that era, so the eighties sort of metal type music I struggle to enjoy it because of sort of the Americana theme like sometimes that just doesn't vibe with me that's racist um <laughs> completely <laughs> but fair enough but fair enough yeah <laughs> we can all hate on Americans right um <laughs> but no I actually really enjoyed yeah what you guys discussed as well the narrative throughout and sort of I really enjoyed sort of these little interludes these spoken sort of you know like real worldy kind of moments in the lead up to these songs and yeah just a bit of humor as well throughout I mean you know they were talking about some serious things um, oh no it all went way over my head Aaron does not pay attention but, but at the same time there was you, you could appreciate the humor that they were kind of um putting through as well in the whole in the whole album so yeah I certainly mm. enjoyed that a lot more than I was expecting to so good choice thanks <laughs> The last time we um we did an album, uh, it was Halloween Town, The Keeper of the Keys, and that had the similar madrigal voice to it. Mm. And there was a whole discussion because we juxtaposed that against Spamalot, which is very outrageous comedy. It's very obvious comedy. And I was thrown off because that was so, that comedy was so obvious. I didn't hear the comedy in The Keeper of the Keys. Um, if anything, I felt like that magical voice does sound almost mocking, like they're skipping around me, laughing at me, um, mocking me. Not me personally, I guess, but you know what I mean? Like that sort of wearing pantaloons with a lute and a hat with the feather in it, right. which is fun, I guess. Yeah, that's not the typical image that sits in my head. If you're a, if you're a big uh, medieval Renfair fan it's, it's the thing for you i i don't mind a bit of maypole i'll, I'll tell you that that's for another <laughs> podcast i i quite I, and I i did like that that militaristic drumming at the start yeah. the, whatever however it goes it did remind me a little bit of sunday bloody sunday mm -hmm. or the other way around right. I, I i know silent lucidity i don't even know how to say their name i had a whole a whole joke about how to say their name but it's, it's because of the umlaut it makes it look more complicated than it is i think yeah i, I would like to say there's queen's right chi um but i don't think that's the thing at all i'll have the tandoori chicken and a queen's right chi please yes that's what it, <laughs> doesn't it sound delicious i mean if you look at it from the way that it's spelt though like it, ignoring the umlaut on the y that uh c h e sound for germans anyway it's reich so queen's reich queen's reich yeah. Okay. So I guess then trans transposed into Australian then would be Queen Queen's Reich. Queen's Reich, mate. Yeah. That's how yeah, you say mate. it in Australian. <laughs> I think in America they were mostly known as Queen's Reich also. Were they? Mm. Pretty huge, but that's as I said, the only ones like the only song I I know about them. And yeah. This album was highly regarded. Yeah, it was I think it was kind of they, they did have a couple of other albums that were, were really big records too, but this I think was their kind of 
pinnacle. Did you listen to this kind of music while you were doing Tommy? So they help you get in the vibe. I was listening to a lot of Who music, Matt, which I which I had always been doing, you know, before that. When I was a kid, I used to I remember checking out books in the library that were like books of rock and roll photographs. And I I found at one point I used to uh, put a thin piece, piece of paper over the photographs and I would trace them and then I would, you know, take it and I would try to fill it all in myself. And because uh, I wasn't confident as a drawer to just freehand drawings. Now you start. can see what's behind me, Michael. <laughs> I'm not confident as a drawer either. Lara is great at it. Not confident either. But yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. But I had, I had a photo that I had done a drawing from of Pete and, and with Roger in the background. It was from, it might have been, it was in his like uh, boiler suit phase. So it was him like jumping up in the air with his SG and Roger was in the background singing and so I had been, you know, a, a lover of the band for a long time, and which made getting this job really wonderful and really terrifying at the same time, because, you know, I, I knew enough to really be in awe of these guys. Um, yeah. But I didn't know, I didn't know all of their, their whole catalog when I started doing Tommy, and especially the earlier stuff in the 60s stuff, I kind of dug into a lot more. And we did actually a lot of historical research and a lot of time sitting around the table with Des and then later with Pete also, um, talking about the historical context of the story, like, you know, what was happening in England at that time. And, and then also talking about the Who's story and where this, where this record fit in their history and, 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 and just where the band fit in in the, in the history of rock and roll. It was, you know, it was kind of at a point where when Pete and Roger started the band, the idea of having a career in rock and roll nobody thought this was something you were going to do for your whole life. It was something you did as a kid and then you would get a proper job. Mm -hmm. And, and yep. most bands didn't even make albums. The idea was that you just made a bunch of singles and then eventually you'd put them together on an album and try to you know, get people to buy that because of the singles. You know, we learned a whole lot. And so I listened to a lot of not very well versed in who, in who music through that whole process. Making the, the whole process, I guess, all that more gratifying because doing Sweeney Todd, I guess you can't really go back to Penal Colony Tasmania and ask them how their, their life's going. No, much much as I asked. No, no. <laughs> how, no, no, uh, where, where they came from. What's their personal history? We're going to jump to a quick ad break. We'll be back in a moment with Michael Cerverus. Oh my God. This summer, winter, spring, or fall, the first ever musical theater sitcom where you go behind the scenes of the latest West End show, The Fosse Forest Ballet. Where's the important stuff? Aha! A thousand pound a week ensemble rate. Ah, that's what Mamma Mia likes. Starring Philip Joel and a West End cast featuring Carrie Alice, Darren Denny, Louise Demon, and Oliver Savile, and more. It all started in 1987 when I was a jobbing actress working in a diner. Yeah, it's just I, I had a really bad experience when I was touring Australia with a wombat. <gasps> Darling! How long have I been mentoring you? Three months? Two years. So her name is Henrietta. The horse. Yes. I've managed to secure you an audition for the biggest, most innovative, and the latest show to be going into the West End. Joseph and his technical dream coat. Think more along the lines of Pant. Frozen. You can watch this episode for the price of a coffee. Simply go to www.thefussyforestbelly.com. Any and all profits go back to theatre charities, acting for others, and the Theatre's Trust. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll see a grown man in sparkly tights. Tight nights. Nice. Tight. Um, we'll move on to Tommy um, anyways, because that's our musical of the week, which I, um, I am so goddamn excited to say that I have tickets for for 71 days or... 72 days from now it's like so exciting who's who's doing it there where what um what victorian it? opera oh wow yeah they were meant to do it last year and obviously last year didn't happen right i only found out about it actually two days i think it was after you said yes to doing this oh, wow. interview 
And so I, I think I messaged you straight away and I'm like, holy shit, it's coming to Melbourne. Like the first professional tour in Melbourne and I will sell my nephew in order to have tickets to that, which I have now. Done. Which is my- What, you've sold your nephew? No, I sold my soul. <laughs> I am terribly excited. Now, I, I'm a bit confused because I've always known it as a rock opera. And even when it was done on Broadway, everyone says it's the musical version of the rock opera. But isn't it still just the, everyone's looking at each other and screaming at each other. It's a rock opera. I'm sorry, I disagree. There might be a couple of lines in it, but that's a rock opera, if you ask me. Yeah, if there's, if there's one page of dialogue total i would be surprised yeah a little at the very start and then and then quite near the very end i have a few lines to sally simpson before we go into uh we're not going to take it in stuff that's right now sally simpson's actually one of my all-time favorite songs the the original who mm. version mm -hmm. absolutely love that and uh, i developed a whole character based on sally like someone who ran away with a rock star which ended up being the mother of the main character of my novels. Larry, you've never known this, although you've... Um... No, it's really interesting, actually, to hear that now. Yeah. It's cool. She's, uh, that's Tina. Makes sense. Uh, but visually, mm. Polly, the little blonde thing with the pigtails. Mm. That's, uh, that's, that's these pictures behind us uh. there. Uh, but anyways, it's not about that, that. But that's just how much Tommy has inspired me creatively over the years. So the drumming... If you've ever sat in a small room with surround sound and just turned Tommy up really, really, really loud, you'll know what I mean, that you just lose yourself in those drums going all around you all the time. The way our show was squeezed into the theater at, uh, I mean, both theaters at La Jolla and also on Broadway, but even more so on Broadway, I think. And there was, you know, there were so many hydraulic things and stuff that there wasn't a lot of room under the stage for the band. We actually had the string players were on the fifth floor of the theater so that they could be far enough away from the drums and guitars and just simply there was no room for them in the in the basement anyway and they had a yeah. you know a live feed and they wow. had a computer monitor and they could they could watch the conductor on the monitor and but i used to go down because i didn't enter the show for the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of it. So I would go down sometimes and just sit in the pit to listen to the band live. And it was it was deafening, but it was it was fantastic. And 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 yeah, the drums, you know, when you gotta when you gotta live up to Keith Moon, you got a lot yeah. a lot to do. Like that's it. I, I will confess I I did watch a bootleg. Sorry, theater producers. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh cool. Oh I, that's all right. You you don't hate me. Good. No, I'm thank you. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fan of bootlegs. I mean, I guess maybe growing up as a as a rock and roll fan, and and, I, and I've never I've never believed that somebody somebody who cares enough to want to watch, you know, what's inevitably a you know badly shot, badly you know bad audio, fuzzy, grainy, whatever, very terrible. Yeah, yeah. but it, if you care enough to watch that, you are not going to not buy a ticket when you have a chance to. You know. No, I, I did watch it after I bought my ticket. I, I will say that. I, no, I, I have to ask, how much did you want to just sit the hell down after every show? Because you guys didn't stop. It was constant. No, although, although I did, I got to do a fair amount. I mean, relative to everybody else, I did a fair amount of sitting because for a lot of the show, Tommy is what we used to affectionately refer to as a meat puppet. And he's just, you know, sort of sitting there mute or getting carried around on the shoulders of the lads and um, and plopped down on the sofa and stuff. So so I actually got more of a break than than other people. But then I paid for it with being in a flying harness at, at various places. So that was you that flies in? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because that was very blurry in, in the footage that I saw. And I couldn't quite tell. It felt blurry when I was doing it. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and to have to do that eight shows a week, mm. like... But, you know, but it was, it was great because of just what you're describing. Like it was such a freight train. Like once it started, you didn't have time to think about whether you were tired or not. And you didn't have time yeah. to sit down and, and relax and then have to kind of enter it in, enter into it again. You just sort of got on the train at the beginning and you got off at the end. And it's one of the things I think that made it possible for me to do it as long as I did. And, you know, I did it for over four and a half years and on two continents and, three cities and I did uh, 1,405 shows, I think, over 
that. Wow. Damn, I don't think I've done anything 1,400 times other than nap. Uh, now, for those at home, <laughs> they might be interested to know that Marsha Mitzman was um, obviously Mrs. Walker in the musical. Now, if you watch The Simpsons, you might know that Maggie Roswell, who had voiced Helen Lovejoy and um, Maud Flanders, left the show in 1999 for a couple of years and was taken over by Marsha Mitzman. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so for those at home, there's an interesting little tidbit for you guys. And also, don't write to us. We know Eyesight for the Blind uh, was written by Sonny Boy Williams and the second. Yes, we know. Uh, it should actually, I think, be written on the poster, if you ask me. He wrote a song from that musical. It should be on the poster. Yeah. Uh, that's my beef there. Now, I, have, I do have a, a little beef because seeing footage of the 1993 Broadway production, which you knocked everyone's socks off and that wig, I have to uh, have a little... That was, that was my childhood haircut right there. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the the trauma and the memories. Um, I had a I had a whole point to that, and now I've completely forgotten it because I I threw myself off with my haircut. Pete really wanted it to be that look because it reminded him of Keith Moon's haircut when he first joined the band. Oh, lovely! Yeah, so that's a nice little Easter egg. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah, no, that's what it is. Now, if a Victorian opera, I've paid one hundred and thirty dollars. If I get there and there is scaffolding on the stage. There is no scenery, no no flying in, no no in my face. I will complain because I want to be blown away. I do not want to hear stomp, 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 stomp on your scaffolding for two and a half hours or however long <laughs> it goes for. Yes. So I just have to get that. Is, is that something that tends to happen at the Victoria Opera? Um, no, but it seems to be a rock opera thing or a yeah. we're doing a rock musical. Let's put fucking scaffolding and save ourselves some. Sorry, Michael. No, but it's, you're, it's, it's I, an ongoing rant. <laughs> I I'm I'm with you on that. Like like the first oh, you know, the five. first the first few times, sure. But at a yeah. certain point, it's like yeah, come on. It's yeah. I want some design. I want even if it's not the windows flying in and out that you guys had on the Broadway. Whatever it is. I know there's going to be a lot of projections because it's already credited in the on the poster who's yeah. doing the projections. Yeah. All right, I'll put up with that as long as there's no scaffolding and I don't want to see the band on stage. Full stop. I I, I don't want to see the band. <laughs> <laughs> I love their work, but those drummers with their big arms, I don't need the distraction. I'm there to see Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Taken away from the show. <laughs> it is. I am single, remember. <laughs> Yes, sorry. That's uh, I'm just getting that out there now. I don't I, I don't know if I can agree with you on that. I always think the musicians deserve to, you know, have more to be more featured than they are generally. I yeah, I don't mean any disrespect, yeah. I promise. Um if they're tucked away where I don't have to see them. It's just all about the arms. Yeah, it is. It's those drummers with the, or, the arms. Or maybe like... maybe they just need to find more drummers with spindly arms so it's not too distracting. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah, more drummers that look like me. More. I will be turned off straight away. More indie rock drummers. That's what you need. Yeah, I see. I, I run away from indie <laughs> rock. I, I'm not that depressed. Shit. So I feel like the difference, like the Who original concept album, mm -hmm. I feel like it is really different in sound than the actual performance. I mean, that's obviously, um, you know, because there it's, you know, just them singing it versus like male and female. So you've only got the male voice. So there's a massive difference yeah. there. Um, also the songs that were included and not included um, and redone a little bit for the purposes of, you know, um, a stage performance compared to like an album performance. I don't know, obviously having listened to both, I don't really know which one overall is better. Like I, I, because it depends on the context. So well, they're both pretty ladies. Yeah, <laughs> very gorgeous. I feel like the Who's version, you know, is like I, I actually like really enjoyed it. It was like I was like, quite often caught a little bit off guard with the stage performance version. Um, just because I think I because I had listened to the Who's first, mm -hmm. um, and hearing the different ways that they interpreted, um. But I did, obviously, there's some songs there that are, like, absolute classics, I feel. Um, and even without being in, and like, in, how do I say this, without listening to it in a whole album, 
like if you just listen to one song, there are songs in there that could definitely be like, you know, your number one song type songs. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was like, I thought it was very interesting having to listen to both because I felt myself comparing the two and I didn't really want to do that because I felt like they're in two completely different worlds. Yeah. And I'd be curious to know which, which songs like, you know, me coming from not really having heard these necessarily in a context where I've recognised them in the past, I'd be curious to know which one, which of those songs are actually like the number one songs of the album because I felt myself drawn to a couple of songs on both albums or both versions, I should say. Which ones? So, well, obviously, Tommy, Can You Hear Me? That's just because it gets repeated so many times throughout. Yeah. I really like the Sally Simpson song, which oh, I yeah. don't know. Do they do that on both? Yeah, it was just very different. Yeah, in they the, do. In the stage version. Yeah, okay, there you go. So I thought that was a really cute song. And I think, yeah, I think I preferred one version over the other. Um, Sorry, and then <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And that's why I found it a little bit difficult to, like, in comparing the two, because the two have different contexts and different meanings like mm-hmm. on a stage performance even though they're telling the same story they have like a different kind of like presence when you listen to them if mm-hmm. that makes sense yeah yeah I mean the acid queen obviously is a pretty cool song as well I enjoy both like that did you listen to the Tina Turner version no there's a Tina Turner version yeah she was in the movie oh my god I'm gonna like hang on I've never heard of it I'm just gonna listen to it quickly that's pretty cool yeah it makes sense that, like, it makes sense for her voice Yeah. to have done that. Like, that's pretty cool. In the movie, there's Alton John and Eric Clapton as well, mm. plus Jack Nicholson has a very small role. There's definitely some, like, real, like, real good songs that don't need to be, like, the, the album doesn't need to be heard in the same order no. or needs to be heard as a whole for you to appreciate how those songs were written and I think then that's why I can like sort of lean myself way back to the Who's version of it because they're good little stories in songs in themselves. Well they are almost aren't they? Yeah yeah they are and they're like like some of them and I mean for me it's like a little bit tricky because like when you actually know the story of what's happening it's like you know this this whole story starts off because of trauma and then you know, this child, like, grows and then you kind of, again, see him grow and change from his story then towards the end as well. And, like, in that context, it can be seen as a little bit cliche because it's like, you know, the typical something bad happens, something good happens, something bad happens, something good happens, you know, and then the story kind of comes to a close. Mm -hmm. So there's there's that. But it's still kind of an interesting story. Like, it's just, I guess... A little bit difficult to kind of like you know because you basically right from the get-go you're thrown into I guess this childhood trauma that is part of this person's life yep. forever for, for the entire story right so that's always a little bit difficult it's not the most original no no it's not it, it, it isn't really but it's still kind of in a way they tried to make it original by putting in certain concepts throughout like you know being like Kimballs, like that's kind of cool, like yeah. um, you know, and especially in the in the context of the area era of where when it's written, that's that's something too. Well, um, um, fun fact about the story: um, early in the recording process for this album, Pete Townsend was doing an interview with a magazine, probably Rolling Stone or someone like that, and mm. they asked him about his next album. What, what, what have you got coming out next? And he started talking about Tommy, but the story was only in its infancy at that stage. So there yeah. wasn't the whole plot. He, they didn't know where it was going to go. But he sat there and he basically improvised a whole story in this interview, <laughs> which then got printed. And that was it. That was the yeah. story that they were stuck with because it had got printed in this article. Yeah. As I say, this has had such a, a vast of effect on, I guess, my childhood. Now, to you've experienced rock and roll fans through Tommy, sci-fi fans through Fringe and The Tick, and obviously Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I'll, I'll explain my theory in a minute that you saved the world. Uh, 
and Broadway fans, obviously, what would be some of the similarities that you've noticed sort of over the years as you've gone into each different, um, or as you've sort of sailed through really each um, fandom? I think, I think, you know, anybody who's truly a fan of any particular thing shares a lot with fans of other things. And, you know, that kind of, it, because I think it's more, I think it's more about, about the fan than the thing they're the fan of. It's about yep. their finding some, you know, some identity or some connection or some, a place to belong in that, in that fandom of that thing that they don't find in the rest of their lives. And I, you know, I'm saying they, as though I am not the same, you know, I, I grew up as a, a total fan and I still am. I still, I work with people sometimes in, music and in theater and film and television that I'm a total fan of. And I'm having to all the time, like squelch my fanboyness to try to <laughs> act cool enough to, to share the workspace. And uh, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I understand it and I appreciate it. And I think, I think that's, that's the thing is that the fact that you will spend inordinate amounts of money and time and care and attention on something that, other people like can't find any use for that's you know that's what being a fan is and whether the object of your fandom is is a movie or a broadway musical or a band it's you know the essence of it i think is the same yeah no it's one thing i've i've noticed um sort of i mean I here you go. Well, we're here I'm too. Just, just really. Yes, I am here too. Thank <laughs> <Yeah>. you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Um, no, I'm really. I'm finding this really engaging. I, I was just kind of curious. Have you ever had the opportunity to play on one of the Tommy pinball machines? Oh yeah. They. They. Yeah. Not, not yeah. only that, but the voice, the you know, the yellow Tommy pinball, the you know, the Broadway Tommy pinball machine. That's my yeah. voice yeah. singing on that, and we had yeah. Yeah. we had like a separate recording session to come in, and uh, Anthony Burley, who played the uh, cousin Kevin, and he and I sang the voices for you know for our characters, and I sang a bunch of other ensemble stuff, and so in payment, they gave me a pinball machine, so I have one of those, which is one of my prized oh my possessions. Um, oh, that is fantastic! Yeah. So yeah, so and that that one in particular, I, I had oh my to do, God. I had to do a um, uh, somewhere like kind of late in the run of Broadway, there was a, a pinball competition in New York, and Lou Reed came. Lou Reed was a huge pinball fan, I don't know, um, and so he was there, and and so they the press department from our show had me go and do an interview with a, a writer from the New York Times at the pinball affair and um and i was supposed to play pinball with this writer from the times and i was like oh god please just let me just let me win because i know what the story will be if tommy gets like destroyed by the writer from the new york times mm -hmm. and luckily and i think we were playing on a tommy pinball machine which i knew well by that point um i just i destroyed him and that's yeah. that's one of my yes. that's one of my crowning <laughs> achievements i think tony's you know awesome. every, Lots of people have Tonys, but I beat the New York <laughs> Times writer on the Tommy pinball machine. That's it. No, uh, uh, look, I just beat it oh, a couple of years ago. I beat a 10 year old at Cornhole and I was so proud of myself. <laughs> I am still bragging about it today to Broadway legends. Uh, now, um, I've been thinking obviously about the, the plot of this because the cult of celebrity is to me what this show is about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I pretty much at the end of it, it's don't, idol worship celebrities because they're all just traumatized children that's really kind of the message i get from it after listening to this album a hundred and fifty thousand times over the years um and i could be wrong because aaron doesn't pay attention as we've established a hundred times already um, but i think that sort of applies very much today in in the times we're living in absolutely the cancel culture and accountability that one person makes one mistake and there goes their fandom it all tumbles down. Yeah, I, I think I think it's you know Pete Pete Townsend has always been a very acute watcher and and uh, understander of his audience. I mean, he used to terrific story he told us when we were in that kind of early research phase. 
the whole thing when they were when the who were coming up was all about and, and you've seen quadrophenia i assume yeah i have it right here on the two disc dvd edition fantastic fantastic and i have amazing journey and tommy and quadrophenia live oh, so you're awesome. as well as tommy on dvd i am I told you, I love me her. And do you know too, Laura? Do you know Quadrophenia? No, I don't. I don't. Yep. It's really great. In some ways, I like the movie of Quadrophenia more than the movie of, of Tommy, even. But it's, yeah. it, <laughs> it's, it's very much about um, what the, the world that the Who, you know, came of age in. And it was this sort of scene where in, within the mod community, which was what the Who's, you know, fan base was. Um, yep they it was all about being the one with the you know the right clothes and the right haircut and and the right dance moves and and the pete and the who were always sort of thought to be like on the cutting edge all the time and and people kids would go to their shows just to see like you know what are they wearing now or what moves are they doing and stuff but pete said what he would do from the stage when they played was he was always watching the audience for that one guy or girl who, you know, had done something different, like they knew each other so well and they would see each other every week at these at these clubs. And suddenly, like one week, the guy who was, you know, the ace face at the time, uh, he w he had gone and had his trouser legs just brought up like an inch or something. So now you saw more of his his uh, Chelsea boots or, you know, whatever. And and so or he was doing some dance move that nobody had seen before. But he was doing it like back in the back, sort of like working it out before before kind of presenting it. And Pete would see that, and then he would start doing it on stage. And everybody thought, you know, oh, this is this is going to be the next big move, or this is going to be the next, you know, cut of my my suit. So he was always very aware of the you know the cult of celebrity and the fascination that fans have, you know, as we were talking about. And also, you know, when they quickly rose to the level of celebrity like we were saying before the idea of having a career in rock and roll was was sort of unknown before that generation of bands um and it it must have been really disorienting and confusing to suddenly you know to just be a bunch of kids growing up in you know rough neighborhoods in in england or you know or in art school as a lot of you know the stones and the who were um but they're just regular kids and suddenly there's like thousands of people screaming for them and 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 it's you know it, it continues to this day i remember when we did the the record signing for the tommy cast album at, at uh, tower records in new york there were just lines and lines around the block and people coming up like they were and i was sitting next to pete so i could see the faces of the people coming up who for whom like he and more than a few said, you know, you kept me from killing myself when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, your music meant that much to me. And, and you said things that I couldn't describe to myself or my friends, or my family. Um, so all of that's a huge amount of burden to put on somebody who's just doing a job and being, you know, creative and trying to do that. And so I think he being the thoughtful person that he is he thought a lot about about that dynamic and that's you know that's what he wanted the story he wanted to tell ultimately is the you know the point as tommy says towards the end the point is not for me for you to be more like me the point is i'm finally more like you um yeah. and it's a message that you're absolutely right is is as relevant and valuable now as it as it ever was i mean we all want everybody wants to lose, wants a simple answer. Like if I just follow this person, if I do what they do and wear what they wear and, and, you know, live my, if I could live my life like that person, then I would be happy, which, you know, usually is being said about people who are deeply unhappy themselves. So. Yes. No. And, and it's an interesting point you, you bring up there that I, I think it's something that people don't stop to consider that it, it is an incredible burden uh, to put on to someone else to say that your your work and what you're doing is keeping me alive, or so that that's a really interesting, ang oh, I guess angle, yeah, a way of looking at it. That um, that and if, if it's one person doing it, 
you can guarantee there's another person in another city doing it and another person in another city doing it and it will just build up and now there's such communication uh, available yeah. online yeah that it's it's even more predominant and, and you can read these comments uh, and, and then when someone stuffs up yeah as every human is going to do yes uh, as josh layman said a couple of weeks ago uh in the future he thinks everyone will be cancelled for 15 minutes <laughs> so i uh yeah i'm looking forward to that one <laughs> yeah. um but yeah no we are only human and and that's the point at the end of tommy he is not some wizard he is not not some miracle he is just human I, I i don't know how he was doing the pinballs <laughs> that's maybe lost on me a little bit but yeah now in terms of uh, doing the show when you moved to germany to do it was there any changes that you sort of made or was it this same high octane no it was it was space? exactly the same exactly. the staging yeah. and everything we did it in english some most of the time I, actually i think I think more often uh, shows would do English speaking shows that were performed in Germany. And there were a lot of them. Um, generally they would do the dialogue in German and then the songs would still yeah. be in English because it was just difficult to translate and maintain the melody and everything yeah, else. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but with Tommy, largely because there was so little dialogue anyway, and it, it didn't make sense to suddenly for a few lines be, you know, speaking German. Um, the only thing that was, <laughs> was a little uh, strange was in the the first five five or ten minutes you know the the overture and the telling of Captain Walker being shot down over Germany and being a prisoner of war and and so we had these Nazi sh soldier soldiers running up the aisles from the house onto the stage and firing machine you know machine guns with blanks <laughs> oh, whoops <laughs> yeah I I think I, I believe the Nazi swastikas were not part of it, but the, you know, the, the helmets were clear. I mean, it was clear who they were. Yes. And you're in Germany and yes. And you're in Germany and, yep. and the Germans were, if anything, more sensitive about it than, you know, than we were. But I do, I do remember the first time we were testing it in tech and, uh, and we had just, and the crew were all German. And so they, we ran on the stage and were sort of firing machine guns every place. <laughs> Everybody was just a little unnerved by the meta theatrical aspect of this moment. Goodness me. Uh, now, did you listen to that German recording that I sent you? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that, I, I quite liked them um, because oh, oh, obviously the, I'm going to say it straight up the, the Who's Tommy, their original album is the greatest album that I've ever heard. Absolutely. It's a precursor to punk. And again, I'll fight anybody on that. Look, I, I watched a news report of your Broadway production and the news reader said short songs about the disillusioned. That is punk right there, people. If I'm sick of arguing with people about this. The irony, of course, is that punk, you know, uh, Johnny Rotten, John Lydon and, and all that generation, what they were thinking at the time was, you know, we are posing ourselves as the antithesis of big bands like The Who and The Stones. Yeah. And and they saw themselves as an entirely different thing. But the irony was that those guys were exactly them when they when they started. Yeah, yeah exactly. And and that's I would you go back and do it again as as Mr. Walker probably this time, not as Tommy, <laughs> I'm guessing. When when people ask that, they usually say, you know, you could you could be Uncle Ernie. It's like, yeah, I would not want to be Uncle Ernie, especially not <laughs> these days. <laughs> Holy shit. Now I was gonna actually ask you, is there any question that you don't want to be asked again by any <laughs> journalist? And I'm gonna put that out there and say, journalists, stop fucking asking that for crying out loud. Holy shit. Um, we did a we did a reunion. Uh, concert um la well it was right before the pandemic i think it was like the december december 2019 okay um yeah. out in la jolla where we had first done it and uh it was a benefit and fundraiser for the la jolla playhouse and um and we got not everybody from the original production but but quite nearly everybody and yeah. and had this amazing band and uh, it was a one-off thing. There is a video someplace. I don't know if it'll ever surface or not, but uh, 
but it was it was so wonderful to sing all that stuff and and we had the band on stage i'm afraid you know and and the drummer did have pretty remarkable arms but um but it was great cuz that was one thing too when when singing and playing it i i did get to pete took me on a he did a solo tour at one point during the first year of tommy on broadway and he had me come out to the west coast and sing a few songs from tommy as part of his tour on stage with his band and so i you know i got to hear oh, wow. hear it at the volume that it is supposed what, to be when you're on stage what year was that that was um that was 90 93 or 94 it was a pete townsend solo tour uh, uh the psychedelic tour and he just brought me out to do like a tommy suite in the middle of the of the thing i got to meet yeah. eddie vetter on that tour oh, wow. Berkeley when he, cool jam. that was yeah that was pretty cool so it was so great being on stage and singing this stuff again. And of course, your first fear is, can I still sing it? Because mm -hmm. I was, you know, that was a long time ago and I haven't sung <laughs> that high for a long time. Um, but I did and everybody did. And uh, Cheryl Freeman did Acid Queen and still like just tore the roof off the place. And, um, and it was great. And it was, you know, we obviously, most of us are, are too old to play those roles anymore. But just like when you when you go see the Who now when they tour and they do still when you see Pete and Roger and they're considerably older than they everybody remembers them being. But when they start playing, it doesn't matter. They haven't lost it. Yeah, yeah, it they haven't matter. lost a step. And and it kind of felt like that for us as well. It wasn't a production that would ever, yeah. you know, see Broadway. But it yeah. was it was great to sing that stuff again. Well, no, because it's coming back. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah Mostly. um is it gonna be in its original form or are we are we getting an all new des mackinoff is directing it why i'm wondering um, yeah and i i haven't heard that i mean i i would love to see it really kind of reconceived and re thought of all together yeah. i mean i think the temptation is going to be this is the the creative team that put the first production together so they'll you know i heard some talk about sort of trying to stage it in a way that would not feel like it's a museum piece, but I would love to see somebody really interesting, you know, a person of color or, a, you know, a woman or, a, you know, somebody from a marginalized community to really think of who Tommy is today. Like I thought there probably I have a is a suggestion sure. <laughs> oh, oh, of a person to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I'd be more than happy to I'll volunteer Broadway <laughs> if you want to hire me to reconceive Tommy. Well, now we know where to find you. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I think I think it would be fascinating. And I, you know, I think Pete might even be, you know, up for the idea because he, you know, he's yeah. never been precious about any of his creativity. You know, I was trying to I was telling a friend who thought I was crazy that I thought it'd be fascinating if Tommy was sort of looked at through the lens of of the trans experience and, you know, or, or, you know, something, uh, yep. some other kind of marginalized community. I think, I think it could really make it, uh, I think, I think it wouldn't be a, a stretch and it wouldn't be uh, a gimmick. I think you could do something really interesting with it that would make it a good case for why you do it again, other than the songs are great, you know. It is, it is very much a timeless album. It was funny because when I first heard the Broadway, I must admit it was, it took a bit of getting used to because I was so used to sure. the original yeah. and just a couple of voices. Uh, and then suddenly there's an ensemble and Beach Boys harmonies. And yeah, yeah it, it, it does change the show, I think, in a lot of ways. So I guess I can see. I guess how people would call it the musical version of the rock opera. Shut up. It's a friggin' rock opera there, dude. As I say, a musical, you're looking at the audience smiling. A rock opera, you're looking at each other screaming and spitting. Yeah. That's Tommy. Yeah, absolutely. That is Tommy right there. Now, um, you said before that you've had your fandoms. So what would be your embarrassing popcorn favorite that you've never wanted to admit? And remember, you are under oath. G'day listeners, Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time? Go to www.thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time 
and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. Crack, thud, the human trips over the uneven ground as the Twanimal blows out the lantern. Watch your step, Kapoor says a little too late. Why did you put the light out? Bolly kosh, an open flame near hay bales? And here I thought you were smart, sir. Toniston agrees with how silly he must have sounded. What are we doing out here? The boy asks as they blindly walk around the side of the house, where they're greeted by giant shadows rising up above them. Unable to properly see in the pitch black darkness, Toniston presumes they are the three hay bales. He looks around. The plains are vast and the spotlights out in the distance, now a purple colour, seem to be too far away to bring any real light to them. They do, however, look very pretty dancing on the rippling oceanic sky. Stand back, the silhouetted cub paw warns with his gruff but friendly voice, clearly able to see in the darkness better than the human who had constantly refused to eat his carrots. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! your embarrassing popcorn favorite that you've never wanted to admit and remember you are under oath <laughs> i was a huge fan of the television series nashville which, which i started watching uh because i was a big fan of friday night lights television series jason cadams yeah yeah and connie Britton was you know played the coach's wife in in that and i always thought she was just fantastic and so she was in nashville so i you know i watch it and no, it, it's about as authentically about Nashville as any, you know, mainstream TV show is going to be, which is to say, not all that much, but no. I didn't, I didn't care. It was, you know, it was just a great yeah. soap opera. There were great musicians mm -hmm. in it and, and all that, but it was, yeah, that was, that was definitely a, a guilty pleasure pleasure passion of mine it's not really embarrassing though i'm a little bit disappointed i was hoping for like the spice girls or something like something that's gonna make the front cover of a playbill look i i went to the opening day of the spice girls movie you and me both michael there you go you and me both <laughs> i was go. by myself at 11 or 12 years old a little soon to be gay boy <laughs> in denial telling everyone no i'm straight i love jerry i i would kiss her or whatever i was saying at Bloody 12 years old, whenever it was. I would brush her hair or whatever you do. Yeah. But see, I wasn't embarrassed about that. I was proud of the fact. In fact, <laughs> it was during, we were doing Titanic on Broadway at the time. And David Constable, who was, um, who was also in the show, he and I went to see it together. And when we got back, they were, they were going to be in town. They were, they were doing a, a concert tour, I'm sure, to promote the album. Letterman. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can probably. tell you right now. I probably still have it on VHS, <laughs> Michael. I probably still have it. Well, anyway, sorry. <laughs> we we had we wrote a letter inviting them to come see Titanic and had our press the show's press department invite them to come yeah. see the show. As I also did myself with Morrissey when he was coming through town and you know I would I would sort of do this nobody ever took us up on it but you know no. but the, the the invitation went out to the Spice Girls to come see Titanic on Broadway. Yeah well if I'm ever in town and you send the invite out I will come and see you in whatever show you are doing. It's, <laughs> um, it's only me but um anyways with um two of your frat brothers in office during both original Broadway and off-Broadway runs of Assassins. <laughs> the timely fashion of that did not go unnoticed, even over here. Oh, really? Did you experience much backlash in that pre-social media days? Yeah, well, we would have these... Um, uh, we're talking about Assassins. Um, yes, and, sorry, uh, I should have made that clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, for Laura's sake, is, is a Stephen Sondheim musical about... <laughs> John Wilkes Booth and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and and the the people who up to that point had attempted to 
and in some cases succeeded in killing the president in America. Mm -hmm. That's um, fantastic, Gary. You've got to say it. Get it, over your non-musical <laughs> bullshit. And it's Sorry. it's a really it's a really insightful critique of American society and culture and yeah. um and the cult of celebrity and the cult of celebrity as well and, and how it da damages people very true look at um what's his name with jody foster and john hinkley. unworthy of your love yeah uh, john hinkley yeah that's it he's getting released or yeah something isn't he or something's happened or he's yes I, I think or he's up for parole maybe or something he's got a youtube channel that's what it is he has a youtube channel but um we did we had a lot of audience discussions talkbacks afterwards yeah where the cast would come out and and they were fascinating because those things are always complicated and most often you find yourself sitting on stage answering for the director why various things were done you know the audience will want to know you know why did why did you do this and it's like well i did it because i was told to do it and if you want to know <laughs> if you want to know why i was told to do it you'll have to ask the people who told me but this was fascinating and the audience who stayed uh, were people who had strong opinions about what they had just seen, some of which were really positive and encouraging, and some of which were really not. And there were like near fisticuffs in the audience between audience members starting to yell at each other about whether the show was just glamorizing violence and, and glamorizing these criminals and assassins or whether it was actually using that to say something more valid and more important. And this was also in the months leading up to the Republican convention being held in New York that year. And mm -hmm. we, despite being a critical success and, and extending several times, we were shut down just like a, a month or two before the convention. And there was always a, a rumor that the reason it was shut down was because the the board or somebody on the board or somebody had you know, Republican connections and didn't want to have uh, a musical about killing presidents on stage on Broadway while the Republican convention was in town. Yeah, there's a production that was supposed to have happened last year and will happen. Uh, I I guess maybe this fall, that John Doyle, who directed the Sweeney Todd I was in, uh, is directing at Classic Stage Company in New York. And it's going to be fascinating to see that show again mm. in the current climate, in the you know post January sixth climate, where mm -hmm. things that that we thought were maybe just being exaggerated clearly mm. are not, and the yeah. threat is every bit as real as we yeah. were afraid it was. Now again, the timing of that does not go unnoticed because no. it was meant to be last year when Trump was still in power. Mm -hmm. Liberals, I, I want to know though, these people going in there being offended by what were they expecting <laughs> when they bought a ticket to a show that is literally called Assassins? No. Well, maybe maybe some of them think it's Assassin's Creed, the musical, maybe, you know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. I never, never really thought about that. Which, you know, which maybe is a great idea. Possibly. <laughs> now, have, having done all these, yeah, now, you know what? I, I've been waiting for a video game musical because we've done everything else, haven't we? I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have put it out there in the universe because now it's going to happen. <laughs> okay, we've been having an ongoing discussion here with our, our guests about the current craze of giving a standing ovation to farting in a freaking jar. Excellent. What have, been, have you noticed this change? Well, that, that deserves a setting. Of That's true. But have you noticed that change? I have. And I remember it happening spontaneously and genuinely. The first time I ever encountered it was when I went to see Revival of the Color Purple. Okay, yeah. And Cynthia Riva did her big number in the, I can't remember now. I'm was here. It? Maybe even the first act. Yeah, is that in the first act or, or early in the second? But certainly it's not the end of the show yeah. by any means um but that was such an astounding performance and such an amazing like even as somebody who does this for a living and and watches people do it for a living all the time i was watching her with my jaw on the floor because it just was so beyond you know just a, a skilled performance and that felt you know people would leap up and applaud at the end of that and that felt deserved and and genuine but like with you know every good thing it immediately starts to become the thing and i think it's i think it's led by 
fan groups who suddenly get the idea, oh, I've seen this happen now at this show. I really love this character in, you know, Jagged Little Pill. So when they sing their big number, I'm going to, you know, all my friends are going to stand yeah. up. And and then it starts to become, and, and the actors usually feel this themselves. Like, I mean, shows are designed not to be interrupted in their flow and the the way they're constructed is very much controlled and and uh intentional a precise art form yeah and so when it's when you have to stop and shows like color purple and i know i'm i know for a fact that john doyle struggled with this because he really hates that kind of thing and but you have to, at a certain point, you have to sort of acknowledge, okay, it's going to happen probably most of the time. So we need to build in the possibility for that. But it is disruptive. And and it's really more about, generally, it's more about people sort of wanting attention for the way they feel about yeah. their favorite performers, which is not really conducive to storytelling in the theater. Think about it, the, the more it's going to go on, the more actors are going to think, oh, hang on, I didn't get a standing ovation tonight. What's wrong with me? And it's going to have an adverse effect. Uh, I think actors know when you guys have earned it, and that means a lot more. Yeah, and it and it undermines the value when it does happen, if it starts to feel yeah. like, oh, it's just going to happen all the time. So yeah. it doesn't, it actually, like you say, it, it starts to make you feel less good about the times that it does happen because you don't you don't trust it anymore. Yeah, it should be a natural thing that causes you to to jump up, not a they've finished singing now. I better stand up and applaud. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. okay, had your life been different and you were born, Michelle? What's one female role you wish you could have played? Oh, good question. Um, oh God, or at least one of them is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think I would probably make a pretty good Fosca in Passion. I think that's a really beautiful, really difficult role. Yeah. What else? Would, but maybe, you know, maybe if I'm going to be that different, maybe I should do a character that's not <laughs> dark and tortured and troubled. That's a, always an option. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if you've known this throughout your career, Michael, but you can play happy people. Look, Looking at my resume, you wouldn't think that that's possible. I tell you what, I, and I was saying this to Lara, um, one common thing I find is that actors do prefer to play the villain because you get to sink your teeth into something. Yeah. I mean, I, as a young actor growing up, I was always jealous of the guys who played the, you know, the straightforward hero characters and stuff. But I, once I really started to look at what that meant, well, actually the perfect example is I played Romeo in college mm-hmm. And in a couple of regional theater productions in the earlier part of my career, and then it was a it was a real turning point the day that I was uh, offered the role of Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet in a music in a regional theater. And part of me was thinking, oh, I guess I've aged out of Romeo now. I'm just not that you know pretty ingenue boy role anymore. But then when I got into working on it, I was like, oh, this is the good role in this in this yeah. play, like. Romeo's a sap. Mercutio's fantastic. And yeah, generally the the character actors and the villains are much more interesting yeah. challenges. Was that fun then doing Gotham? Yeah, yeah. Because that's probably the most over the top villain I've, I've seen you play. And it was such a theatrical kind of thing. And, and all of the, the props department and the wardrobe department, everybody was so excited when they heard that, that I was coming to do it because they knew, oh, he's going to be game for, you know, whatever we can yes. throw. And they're, those, they were so creative, that, that show in every department. Um, and the executive producer and, and uh, off-time director, Danny Cannon, I had known for years and years. And so he, I, in fact, I auditioned to play uh, Arthur in, in the original, you know, from the beginning. And, you know, the guy they, I, who did play it is fantastic and perfect. And obviously the guy who should be, who should have played it. Not at all bitter is what you're saying. Not at all bitter. <laughs> no, not at all. But Danny, Danny said, you know, I've, I've wanted to have you on the show for years mm-hmm. and we found the character, the perfect yep. character for you to play. Finally, would you come and do this? six episode arc and it was just so much fun and so i mean i even got to actually do a bit of a of a musical in mm-hmm. the show when uh, when he did the cell block tango thing so yeah it was that was some of the most fun i've had on tv yeah and getting different disguises and accents and, yeah like, yeah 
French chef. Aaron had forwarded me the trailer um, for that. Oh, yeah. And it gave me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> like, it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that show is creepy. And I, I kept saying to yeah. them, you can do this on network TV at 9 p.m.? You're allowed to do? <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Nowadays, I guess yeah, things are, are changing. Um, what, what would be another musical, maybe not Sondheim, but that you would like to play the guitar in? Because obviously with Sweeney Todd, you guys played your own instruments, yeah. which was... See that? Okay, that I can I can totally deal with that because that's part of the the show. That's part of the spectacle that I am seeing. And um, and frankly, frankly, none of our arms were that attractive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll I'll agree. I kind of agree on that. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I'm not I'm not really I'm not really that proficient a guitarist to be able to play a lot of theatrical music. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to really work to to find parts that I could could play in uh, you know in a Sondheim musical that that was a real challenge yeah it's all about jumping in the deep end Christ. yeah yeah um but I'm essentially a self-taught guitarist so so I'm not uh you know it has to be a, a relatively uh simple I mean I, I can hold my own in certain situations but but complicated theatrical music and certainly at the level of Sondheim is is generally beyond me without a lot of work now, obviously, with uh, your band Loose Cattle, you're you're doing country music. What would be one musical that you think could be turned into a, a country musical? turned into a country style? Oh, because obviously the directors are getting experimental these days, which is good. Yeah, I do. I mean, people are starting to write more, you know, sort of purpose built musicals using more kind of contemporary kind of thing. There was that. Was it Bright Star? Or, um... Yeah, Steve Martin. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, who's you know an incredibly gifted banjo player. Um, so there are, and and then there was a play recently at the Public Theater called. Um, it was about it was about West Virginia coal miners and a coal mining disaster. I can't remember Coal Country. I think is what it was called. And Steve Earle, who's a terrific Americana uh, singer songwriter, wrote a bunch of songs for that that he played himself in it. So. Um, and there's this new uh, girl from the North Country, this Bob Dylan musical. So Americana and roots music is becoming more common on Broadway in general. So it's only inevitable someone's going to take Guys and Dolls. Yeah, well, that's do it. see, that's uh, that's a really interesting <laughs> idea, I think. And and trying that to... was just pulled out of my head. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, but but that could be that could be really cool. You know, because so often you get you get Shakespeare plays that are you know, set in the Iraq war or, you know, various things. And, and I think you could do some interesting things. Well, the production of Oklahoma that ran on Broadway recently did that. That band was a, a definite Americana string band and, and the orchestrations yeah. were changed and it made a lot of sense for a show set in Oklahoma, you know. It's a community hall yeah. interactive. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have seen it. I don't think we're going to be getting it in Australia anytime soon. I can't imagine. Well, but you'll be glad to know, not a uh, not a scaffold in sight. So. Oh really? Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> oh, thank God for that. What about hot drummers, though? That's that's my second concern. <laughs> How old were you when you lost your Virginian accent? <laughs> Although I do have written here, do you need a protege? Because I'm happy to volunteer. Wait, wrong interview. Uh, now I guess I don't need to, to ask that. Now, Lara, did you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was, um, I listened to Loose Cattle's newly released album. I was actually heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. I was really, really impressed by the music. So, um, but just out of curiosity, what, what do you think makes a good mashup? Because there was one song there. Yeah, yeah, that... <laughs> That yeah, Jolene yeah. mashed up with CeeLo's Fuck You. Yeah. That was the suggestion of my co-band leader, Kimberly K. When we mm -hmm. even before we started the band, she had that idea to put them together. <laughs> and you know, I sat down to try to do it and I was like, How there's no way, how do you put these two songs together? But then as I started to kind of chip away at it, I realized it's like they were meant to be together. Yeah. I think Part of what works so well in that is that it there's this you know tradition in country music of the he said she said kind of country duets mm -hmm. and there are a lot of you know famous pairs Conway Twitty and Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner and Dolly Parton and so it kind of becomes that in our in our version version um, and I think that's that's one one way to make a really successful mashup of things is you want the songs to comment 
on each other or or be in dialogue with yeah. each other and and that version i think really works yeah. that way and people seem to love it my my dream is to get dolly pardon to listen to it and i have a feeling she would love it yeah. dolly if you're listening I'm sure she's a, a big fan of your show she's she is our number one fan i mean we only have four uh but she's she's i know it's probably the the boring question that uh, gets asked a lot. Do you have a, a preference for what you prefer creatively to uh, sink your teeth into? I've been so lucky to do so much theater for such a long mm -hmm. time that I think things like doing television and film have been a little more exciting to me recently just because I haven't done it as much. And it's also, you know, the eight show a week, six days a week schedule when you're lucky as I've been to to be in shows that run for a long time it really is your entire life for years at a time um, and with a film you can certainly work long long hours or a series you can work long long hours but you get proper weekends you get two days off yeah. and you sell at least the roles that I've done have seldom been the kind of characters that are in every scene every day so um, and you travel to different places, which I find really interesting. Um, so I've been really enjoying the, the television work I've been doing more. And as far as music goes, music has never been something I, I did. And I've done it as long as I was an actor, but it's never been something I did as a way to earn money. In fact, I've probably mostly only ever lost money playing music. Um, so that means that I've always been able to just do it the way I wanted to and because I it made me happy and, and I could just do the parts of the music business that made me happy to do yeah. so I think you know I, I feel a, a freedom and a and a joy in playing music that uh, that's harder to find when I'm when I'm acting because I find acting just a real it takes a lot out of me literally you become someone else well, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, I, I think I feel like I, I would love to, uh, to, to play music all the time. Yeah. But if I was playing music all the time, I probably would find it's as grueling as all my friends who do that. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I can. I guess while we're on the topic of TV as well, um, what can you tell us about the upcoming series, Gilded yeah, Julian oh, yeah. Fellows, um, goodness, talk yeah. about a pedigree. Yeah, Aaron was mentioning yeah. all the Broadway stars. Yeah, it's it's going to be, I think, pretty spectacular. I've seen like a a five minute sort of teaser reel mm -hmm. that they've been passing around the um, the HBO offices to sort of let the different departments kind of know what's what to expect, and it looks exactly like it's felt like doing. It's just this amazing cast of large number of New York theater actors, but also actually uh, several Australian actors and, and some uh, British actors as well. Um, that doesn't surprise me. Australians are getting themselves in anywhere. God forbid you guys come over here and take one of our jobs. They'll cry about it. Oh yeah. But we'll take, we're happy to yeah. take you, your jobs over there. I, I, I don't, I don't think I've done a job that didn't have an Australian in it for years. Really? Oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean Fringe. Oh, of course, yeah. And Mindhunter. So. New Zealander, technically, with um John Noble. He's he's a Kiwi. Oh, is that? Uh, but yeah. they're they're okay. really own our little brother. So, right, right. You know. You're fond of them. <laughs> yeah, we actually we are quite fond of our New Zealanders. Yeah. But it's it's uh it's called the Gilded Age. It is set in New York in 1882, and it looks at Christine Baranski and Cynthia Nixon are sort of the emblems of the old New York and the, you know, the money and society. And they have a, um, a niece who's coming to live with them, whose father passed away and, and she has, you know, fallen on harder times. And so she is kind of making her way in the city. Across the street live Morgan Spector and Carrie Coon, who are kind of representative of the new New York and the new money. And he's a railroad magnate. So it's, it's about the conflict of, of the old money New York and the the new society and and how that you know runs into each other and and of course there's plenty of for fans of Downton Abbey there's plenty of upstairs downstairs intrigue I play the valet of uh, Morgan Spector's character so I'm in the below stairs stories uh, across the street but it's great and it has I think for fans of Downton 
they'll be delighted and all the things that they loved about that show are absolutely a part of the show. But I think in its being set in America and at that particular time in America in the late 19th century, it, it's, it's, you know, 20 years before Downton, uh, the stories in Downton. Um, and it's a time in America, which as I've been doing research, I'm realizing was really kind of the crucible out of which so many of our current problems began. It was the, you know, the rise of industrialization and the, the progressive movements began to, to rise. And it was just after the civil war and uh, the reformation and, and the, uh, uh, so race is a, is a big aspect of the show as well. And, and uh, the women's suffragette mo mm -hmm. movement and everything. So, so it, it's uh, hopefully it's, you know, and if anybody can juggle all of those things, it's Julian yeah. Fellows, you know, and still make it, you know, Christine Bransky has all those Maggie Smith kind of like Beaumont uh, little exit lines and stuff. So I think hopefully it's going to be really beloved just the way Downton is. And hopefully it's going to last for years and years. God, you go from working with Patti LuPone, Julian Fellows to ending up on this show. How far we fall, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, careers take mysterious turns. Yes, COVID has, has got us all scrambling for, <laughs> for exposure wherever we can get it, even with some idiot in Australia. Yep. Now, you say you play a valet, but what dark secrets is he hiding? <laughs> so I had to well, ask. You know, you might be kidding, but it's, but it's, but you'll have to watch and see because. Uh. Many of the characters in the show have, have secrets that they're hiding. Uh, look, it wouldn't be a TV show if at least half the True. characters in it didn't have a secret. Weren't what they yes, seem. That's, yeah. that's the whole point of... Sorry. Sorry, Lara. Oh, well, I was just curious then on that. Like, how do you strike that balance between, I guess, um, the darkness of a character and then also having those empathetic traits that I guess fans are sort of drawn to? Well, that's a great question, and it's, it's something that kind of is at the core, I think, of of my career. Like I've kind of found this uh, this livelihood, sort of arguing for the humanity of seemingly irredeemable people. And I think I think part of it is nobody believes that they're the villain of their own story. Everybody has their reasons for doing what they do, and we may disagree with them, and you know, and we certainly may not endorse what their choices, but it's not that hard to feel, you know, to find connections in your own life to when you felt mistreated or unfairly, you know, unfairly treated and feel like you deserve to get yours. And I think if I see a character, if I, if I have an audition for something and the character has no other side, if he's just purely evil or his only function and the thing is just to be evil, I'm usually not interested in playing that because that's you know that it might serve the the larger story but it's not interesting it's not an inter interesting story and it's not really going to do much for the audience i think partly why actors love to play villains and why audiences love to watch villains is because it it allows them to kind of access a part of themselves that is you know is not appropriate or does not feel you know suitable for public consumptions but they you know they have that feeling they have that feeling like they deserve revenge or feel like people need to pay for for how they've been made to feel or that in spite of the bad things that they've done they still are a good person at heart or they, they you know they mean well or they're you know nobody wants to feel like they're irredeemable and so i think if you can play villainous characters in a way that makes the audience able to s see a bit of themselves in them you're actually doing them a service and and society in a way because I think this is a perfect thing about what assassins does. If we can just write them off as, oh, they're just monsters, they're just horrible, murderous people, then we don't have to deal with what caused them to be like that. We don't have to mm. deal with the society that chewed them up and spat them out and made them feel worthless. We don't have to deal with, you know, what our culpability is in why there are so many gun murders in America. You know, oh, it's just because they're crazy people with guns. No, that's, you know, they weren't born that way. No. We're part of a society that creates this kind yeah. of thing. And so for me as an actor, trying to make unsympathetic characters relatable to people 
hopefully as a way to make people have a second thought about those people and as a result like themselves and the world that we know them Mm -hmm. that's why prisons are so filled up yeah and there's not much focus on mental health exactly exactly it is quite sad and people will question the value that arts have and it is reasons like that that are invaluable to society because a, a message like that about understanding mental health gets into homes by being in a movie in a tv show on an album absolutely if it's in a textbook no one's gonna freaking read it except those who are studying it (laughs) yeah so yeah and you know and and legislation yeah you know legislation doesn't win hearts no that just causes more dissent from the opposition in the end because people don't want to see their opposition have something nice i think the tv series will and grace had as much to do with the eventual passing of marriage equality as you know as any number of bills that were passed you know because it was just people able to to care about people that they think are so different from them and recognize their humanity shared humanity i think that's the way i think society moves forward it is well, anyways we've, we've kept you long enough i've got one comment though in ant-man and the wasp yes your character exploded and did that whole thing and caused his daughter to then be all ghost-like uh if he hadn't have killed himself sacrificed himself to save the world scott lang wouldn't have known that he could travel in time through the quantum realm avengers wouldn't have been able to save the day so alias had to kill himself so the rest of us could live he saved the day in an end game and i will fight anybody on that uh, but in in terms of auditioning what side were you given because i'm guessing it wasn't anything to do with your character actually I didn't even audition for that film. I had auditioned yeah. for two other Marvel films in the six months or so before that and kind of got close mm-hmm. to them and then ended up not getting them. So then I just got, called and offered yeah. this because they'd already yeah. seen a lot of tape of me doing different things. You know, the interesting thing is in the comics, he Elias doesn't die in that, in that egghead. explosion and he goes on to become yeah. Egghead, which I am just like, you know, waiting every day for the call that that egghead is going to appear in in somewhere else in the universe and hopefully that's true that is the the what if animated series i think that's probably your best chance there um yeah are, are you a fan of the the marvel movies because um you oh are? Yeah. yeah yeah very much yeah i was i was more of a marvel kid growing yeah. up in general you know I, I enjoyed it i mean i love the fact that i am one of a fairly small number of people who has a presence in the dc universe and the marvel universe you have the most important presence i mean that rat might have let scott lang out of the van but he wouldn't have been in there if it wasn't for your sacrifice in the first place that's, i really like your way of thinking thank you that's called too much spare time michael <laughs> well i'm i'm a fan <laughs> no there's too many thoughts but no it, it is pretty much because everyone will say that it was the rat but he wouldn't have been right. in, they wouldn't have known to go in there they wouldn't have known that janet was mm, in there the first place. like is in the industry is there like a, a, a sh- can you feel the shift in in how this is all playing out with you know the scott rudens of the world being taken down like can, can you feel it in the air well, it's, I mean, certainly uh, people are m- much more uh, cautious and, and thoughtful yeah. about, about the way they engage with each other. A lot of it is great and really important and, yeah. and long overdue. And it's, you know, it's a hard thing to, to talk about because you certainly don't want to, to stymie anybody who should be talking about yeah. things that are, uh, have happened and, and or are happening. And it's, I think, with a lot of deep societal change, pendulums swing a little too far in one direction before they settle back where, you know, they probably need to be. And, and if, if the, the trade-off for making safer, healthier environment for people to work in is that some of the, you know, more extravagant creativity gets a little stifled for a while, that's maybe a, an okay trade-off until we sort of work it out you know if, if you're going to make a mistake better to make a mistake of being too concerned about people's safety and and humanity yeah. but uh, but yeah it absolutely has changed a great 
deal how people interact with each other in the business. And of course, as is also often the case, the people who are working hardest to to change and be aware and and be better advocates and allies are generally not the people who were the most problematic to begin with, you know, and the people who Mm. are the real problem probably aren't the ones who are taking big looks at themselves. No, it uh, sort of makes me wonder because Harvey Weinstein was taken down, obviously for different reasons. And when he was taken down, I want to, I I would love to have gone uh, being John Malkovich style into everyone's heads, all these powerful producers like scott rudin and just heard the paranoia or was there a a denial was there a that's never going to happen to me or maybe even not even seeing what they're doing because they're so up themselves in terms of living in their own i think i think all the above what was scott rudin thinking over the past couple of years was he really thinking that people would continue to I, I personally don't know what he has done. If he's a tyrant or anything like that, I, I'm, I'm just saying, obviously, that's the situation at hand. And, and even then, as Tonya Pinkin said a couple of weeks ago, he's not going away. He's still going to be making decisions anyway. So right. the people with the power and, right. and all that, they got there for a reason. It's not going to be so easy for them, for anyone to just let them go away, like to have worked with them or benefited from them or or whatnot, but removing an illness is one thing, but you still have to heal the body and yeah. you have to replace that in a, with a, something more positive. Yes. So Oprah, that's just, there's, Oprah there's, everywhere. A, there's a ton of work. There's a ton of work. There is. I mean, Laura, have you, have you felt in, in your work and your, your creative circles, have you felt like things are, are different these days? Yeah. Look, I think people are, people are more concerned about, um, the consequences of their actions, for sure. I still think it exists. Um, I've been very uh, lucky to not really have experienced those things or where it has even come close to it, sort of roll with the punches and put it off to, you know, so that it's deflected from myself and pushed back onto the person who's mm-hmm. doing it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I can be quite headstrong when it comes to things that I don't like. So mm-hmm. um, I can vouch for that right now. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, look, I certainly feel that people are considering their actions more so now. Um, and I guess that sort of self accountability uh, is, is being pushed a bit more, which is fantastic. I think people do need to um, comprehend themselves. Yeah, it's a bit of self awareness yeah. never goes astray, people. Mm. Uh, but, anyways, no, we've kept you for long enough. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been an absolute honor. You're so and- welcome. Yeah. Please join us anytime. Open invitation to come on and just join in the fun anytime. Fantastic. But yeah, so where can people find you on the social medias? Um, I uh, I have Facebook uh, pages. Uh, well, I have I have a couple of Facebook mm-hmm. pages. I have one. I tried at one point to sort of have like a private actual people that I know Facebook page and then a more kind of professional one, but it was, they don't make it easy for you to move people from one to the other. I, I tried for a while. I literally <laughs> sat and wrote to people and said, I, you know, I don't, I'm trying to just, I explained what yeah. I was trying to do. And, you know, would you please, you know, find friend me on this other thing. And it was just, yeah. it took me forever and was only marginally <laughs> successful. So so I have two Facebook pages and then the band Loose Cattle has a Facebook page yeah. as well. And I'm on Instagram at, uh, at Michael Cerverus, I think. And uh, Twitter, I don't use very much. I kind of check in every once in a while, but. And thank you for, for that. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have known each other. Yeah. But um, yeah, I try to, I try to keep up with the kids as much as I can. Not <laughs> even a kid anymore, Michael. I'm 36 now. Like I'm going to be 40 in a couple of years. I'm freaking out. Um, and that's why you're not on TikTok. That's why I'm not on TikTok. No. Yeah, nor nor no. am I. It's true. <laughs> and, and just for those at home, that's the Twitter is at Cerverus. So no Michael at the start of that. And but obviously you're you've just released an album, Heavy Lifting, as we mentioned before. Yes. So that's available on Apple Music and Spotify and Bandcamp and all those things. Bandcamp, yeah. that's that's one. I have no idea about keeping up with what the go, kids. Go go find the kids and ask them how how to get music these days. I have no idea. It's uh, YouTube music, I guess. Is that a thing? Um, 
I think it is because they keep asking me for bloody money, don't they? Oh yeah, there is there is a pay YouTube yeah. thing now. No, I I'll, I'll pay for for Spotify because I like saying Spotify just to entertain myself <laughs> for some reason. Uh, obviously, the Gilded Age doesn't have a release date yet. Yeah, I think early next year, like February, maybe. Yeah, and that'll be on HBO. Yes. So yes. in Australia, that'll be on our Foxtel. So look out for that one. So again, thank you so much for joining us. It is, has been a, an absolute pleasure. Someone who, all the way in Australia, followed your career and, and loved your work over the years. And and for the reason that you do keep ta- uh, taking on the dark characters. I know I've, I've shit-stirred you about it today. And it has been an absolute honour to do that. Out in the world, who gets to say they get to shit-stir Broadway legends for fun? <laughs> You do. My parents would be so proud if they knew about this podcast. (laughs) Um, But I'm not telling about it. But anyway, so do you guys at home, you take care and we shall see you next time. Hooroo. Awesome. That's great. What do you want from me? All right. Just trying to grab me thingy. Wow. Don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, I realised what I said. (laughs)